Hello, hello. Hey, what's going on? How are you? I'm good. I'm we have good. A, we have a special guest waiting in the wings. <laughs> we do. We do. I'm so excited to have her with us tonight. Um, she's going to give us another kind of education that we haven't heard from about before yeah every every time we have a guest on we always say a special guest and it always ends up being very special You're because absolutely right. they, they it's a different perspective to you know what we're trying to accomplish here by educating mothers and providing the resources and just you know yeah. painting painting a picture of what's really going on out there in the, in the world mm -hmm. and hoping to provide to you know do some empathy or some understanding some sort of relationship so people could change their hearts and their minds and really be advocates of, of eradicating racism. You know, it's, it's got to start from somewhere, you know? Well, what, what I found interesting, um, she, I, because I've, I've watched her, you know, she's just had an unbelievable presentation. And so what she did for me is she gave my feelings inside of what I thought was happening. She gave scientific basis for it. Definitely. And so, you know, you have to like, listen carefully and say, connect the dots. And, you know, she's going to tell us the science. And yeah. I, you know what? I believe in science. Yeah. Follow the science. Isn't that what everyone's saying? <laughs> yeah. These days? yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> let's bring her on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Hello, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Ahankai. Oh my God. <laughs> good to see you. Good yes. You yep. Thanks for taking the time to be with us tonight. We really appreciate it. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Good. Well, I'll I'll give our audience a little bit of a background on um, my relationship with you. Um, your sister Biho and I went to Georgetown together, and we actually played women's basketball together um, and attended the university for two years before I graduated, and we've been lifelong friends ever since. And I actually had the opportunity to know Ima at a very young age and all her brothers and sisters and just watch them develop into phenomenal people. I knew they were going to be phenomenal once I met their mom and dad, but just to see it really come to fruition and see the mag, you know, just the magnificent things you and your brothers and sisters have done, um, not only for your family and your country, but also for um, America in terms of just the medical field that you're you're with. And it's just amazing. I feel like a proud big sister. So uh, it's amazing to have you on and I'm excited to, um, to for Donna to hear um, everything she needs to hear as well as our audience. But there's so much for us to really dig in and to dive into. Um, but I wanna obviously um, give you a chance to tell the audience who you are. Um, because I just feel like sometimes, and I don't know Donna if you agree with me, but you know, sometimes people think um, they, they want advice from credible people. You know, they want to know who they are, what what their background and what gives them the expertise, not only from an educational standpoint, point, but a personal standpoint. What gives you the right to say what you say and for us to believe what you say? And I just think, you know, they need to know who you are, not only your, like I said, your educational background, but everything about you as a mother, as a wife, um, as a daughter of two very brilliant parents. Um, you know, let, let the audi your audience know who you are and then we'll get into what you do. But I think who you are is just as important and really needs to be shared. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much again for having me on. It's such a pleasure. Um, so who I am, of course, starts with the wonderful parents that you mentioned. Uh, Vincent and Bernadina Hankai are my parents and they are um, Nigerian. They were born and raised in Nigeria and moved to the US in the mid 1970s, both professionals. My father's a medical doctor. My mother has a doctorate in education. And like many immigrant families, they instilled from the very beginning, education, education, education. That's right. um, and so there are four of us children, my sister who you know really well, um, Abiho, she's my older sister. I have a younger sister, Amwa, and a younger brother, Emo. And so, so we were born in, uh, we were raised in the U.S. in mm -hmm. American suburbs to this, you know, immigrant family. Oh, she's my older sister. I have a younger sister. I'm one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, and so, yes, they they instilled in us education is everything. Right. I think they also, quite honestly, instilled in us. You know, Nigerians are kind of known for their egocentric pride. And I think that was probably very important being in an environment where we were typically minorities, typically one of the only few black families, not only with a different skin color, but with a weird name that nobody knew how to pronounce. Um, 
my parents weren't raised with the sense of, you know, there's some inferiority to being black. And so there wasn't a way for them to necessarily transmit that to us. So right. we were raised mm -hmm. by parents who were very, very proud. Um, but we also, of course, lived in this world, in this American society. So we combated, you know, race in a different way than my parents did. But that was really the foundation of it all um, for us to, to strive for excellence from a very young age. And so we've all kind of gone on our different paths. And I now went into medicine, as you mentioned. Um, I am an infectious diseases physician um, and researcher at Vanderbilt University. My husband, who is also Nigerian, um, Michael Nottage, he is a, a critical care physician, works down here. And we have three beautiful children who are 10, 8, and 3. Um, so my life now is, you know, what of being an infectious diseases physician in the middle of a pandemic. So that's right. <laughs> really interesting. So that's a little bit about me. Very, very important roles. Uh, most importantly, your mother, um, a wife, and obviously um, a medical doctor. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned something that Donna and I have spoken about quite a bit. And, and I think my upbringing is, upbringing is kind of similar to yours and that I'm from the Caribbean. So my parents didn't didn't raise me with the mindset that racism really exists. You know, it, you was you weren't considered other because where they were from, everyone's black. And I'm sure it's the same, you know, obviously in Africa. So it wasn't about racism. It was more classism and different things that separated people. But it was never the color of our skin. Right. So when my mom came to America, it wasn't something she prepared me for. It wasn't something she spoke about. It wasn't even something she experienced growing up. So there was no tale to tell. And I think, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, you, your parents brought you up that way as well. Um, but obviously your environment taught you different and you started to see things that maybe weren't really um, talked about at home or you weren't forewarned of in your household. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very true. And um, I think my mother very quickly became attuned to this difference. Um, we joke about it now because my father, it took him a long time to see to see race in the way that Americans typically do. Um, so I think that my mother tried very hard to protect us with the tools that she knew, which were advocacy and making sure she was there all the time to say, this child is doing well in this, she needs this opportunity. Um, and and making sure that 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 path was laid out so that our, our educational opportunities were never shortchanged. Right. So Wonderful. she did a excellent job with that. Yeah. Great. Well, you went to Harvard. Yes. Abiho went to obviously Georgetown. Right. Your brother went to, uh, you know, one of your sisters went to UPenn, correct? Amwa, um, yeah. Amwa. Um, and then your brother, he went to LaSalle, but he's also a physician right now, correct? Oh, no, actually, he's in the business world, right? Yeah, he he's, went to the University of Pittsburgh. Yeah, and he has an, his MBA now. Right. So, mm -hmm. Great. So that's great. Well. My parents did a great job. Very, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I get a lot of slouches in your family, I see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I, I, you know, that's that's something my parents also instilled in us. We didn't know there was a choice growing up. See, that's something key in my world is that we didn't know there was a choice. We knew we were supposed to go to college. Oh, you do something else? You know, we didn't know that you did something else. Mm -hmm. That was, it's exactly the same for us. You went, you go to college and graduate school and that was <laughs> end of the story. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, what, tell us what about one of the first experiences you had with race growing up where, you know, it was evident that, you know, you were being judged by the color of your skin and you may have gone home and told mom and dad, or even had a conversation with your brothers and sisters, but was there a moment in your life where you kind of stopped and said, whoa, this is serious yeah. and, you know. Well, I think that it's interesting, you know, you have all of these encounters um, as a young kid, um, as a young girl, especially because, you know, Abiho and I, my older sister and I are a year apart. So we were always in school together. And like I said, often one of the only, only ones, of the only minorities or African-Americans. And so it was hard to know sometimes, is it, because our name is different? Is it because we're mm. black? Is it because my hair is different? And so I don't think I understood fully for a while what the difference was about. And right. even though my parents and my mom especially was advocating for us, we didn't necessarily have um, these conversations that people are going to look at you differently when we were little. Um, and one 
um, instance of that, when we moved into our um, our home in Pennsylvania and the sub suburbs of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, kids in the neighborhood spray painted nigger on our on our um, garage door. Really? And never knew about it. My parents painted that over before we got back from school so that we wouldn't see it. And it wasn't until years later that they we saw pictures. And we were like, what was this? What happened? And they never they never told us about it. Of course they wanted us to feel safe in our new neighborhood. We were, you know, in first uh, first and second grade at the time. But the thing that I think resonates so much with me, because by this time I was fully aware of this dynamic, was in high school. And in my high school, public high school, 800 something people in my graduating class, I was the only person that got into Harvard that year. And I remember this so clearly because it was in, both in the newspaper and on a local radio show that um, clearly I got into Harvard <gasps> because. Oh, oh. Oh, very advantage. Really? And wow. I worked my tail off, you know, I worked yeah. very hard for what, and so I think it's one thing to have some fears or suspicions, and it's another thing to just hear people saying, you know, this great achievement, you know, you're a senior in high school, you're on cloud nine, you get into a great school, and just taken away from you. Yeah. Like, you didn't earn this, you didn't deserve this. That was that. I also remember a college counselor that we had um, tell, told me not to apply, not to apply to Harvard. Not, and I had excellent grades. I, I did well, mm -hmm. um, and said, you know, why don't you apply to some other safety schools? Let's take this these off your list. And of course, that's the worst thing you can say to someone who's wow determined. Um, now, now, how do you feel this has, ex if if it has, how do you feel it's? Ex it's uh, affected your experience, with it, whether it's in your career or just with your children. You know, having gone through that, I would consider trauma and very traumatic because I have a similar situation too, where my um, elementary school principal told me not to apply to the all white high school. I eventually ended up attending and yeah. simply was because I was black and it was all white high school. So I ended, and attended the high school, did well, played great basketball, and obviously ended up at Georgetown. but. It, it it scarred me. It scarred me for life, but it motivated me to prove people wrong, Pro prove those who didn't believe in me because of my color that right. I can achieve and do anything. So it motivated me. What did that experience do to you in, after? It's definitely been very motivating, like for you. Um, I think this is a badge that, that we all as minorities wear. I don't know if a badge is the right word. It's an extra weight. It's an mm -hmm. extra burden of you know living by a different standard and so you become very acutely aware of that from early on that if your record is not impeccable then someone can always come in and say x or y or z it's because of this it's because of affirmative action it's because of unfair opportunities and so i definitely had that approach to life and to say, i my record has to speak for itself mm -hmm. That was one. I think the second thing that um, I encountered um, during my residency, so I did my four years of, of undergraduate, I went to Harvard, I went to Hopkins Medical School, a wonderful medical school, and then I was in residency. And residency, you know, you're, you have your MD, but you're training in your specialty. And I was um, presenting about one of the patients I admitted to my senior physician who was training me. And I remembered very clearly, he, he, I answered some questions. He was you know, asking to make sure I knew what I was talking about. And he said, I'm a, I didn't realize you were that smart. <laughs> Sorry, that's just, that's... I, you know, I think that, that experience probably <laughs> devastated me more than the high school. Oh. And I'm thinking, what, why? Right. You, you know, you, I went to Harvard. Right. Mistakes. I went to Hopkins undergraduate. My grades are good. What would make you assume that I'm not smart? Really? Um, That's right. Yeah. You should have said, "Do you know who my mom and dad are? <laughs> have you have you met my mom and dad? <laughs> no. Have you met me? Have you have you met me? Yeah. Have, are, are you not no, seeing me? Her pedigree is phenomenal. Yeah. Hmm. That made me realize that it's not in my record isn't enough. Right. That I also because I'm. I'm an introvert, I'm on the quieter side, but I, I realized that 
I had to assert myself in a way that I wasn't totally comfortable with. Mm-hmm. But again, mm-hmm. this is me playing to the crowd. You think I'm not smart? Okay, let me be clear when I'm in the room that I know what I'm talking about. Right. And so that's that's been a professional challenge for me because it's not my personality. I'm not boisterous. I'm not out there. But but that's something that I learned a little bit later that I've that I've that I've had to work on and develop. Yeah. We have to find our voice. Most definitely. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, how has that um translated to you being a mother? Um, and obviously three children. Um, you have an eight, a ten and an eight year old. That's your oldest too, correct? Right. Um and now and with, three and a three year old. Three year old, right. But now with the eight and the 10 year old, have you had conversations with them about the climate in America and racism and, you know, preparing Mm. them for what they're, what they they might encounter on any given day at any given moment? Have you had those conversations with your children? We've begun Mm. to, but honestly, this is a really, this is a really difficult conversation that my husband and I have been struggling with. And I think that not the importance of having these conversations, but the timing because I feel very strongly that once you open this can of worms for children, it, it doesn't close. This is right. the rest of your life. And so you kind of, you want them to have their innocence for as long as they can and not carry this burden that we all carry. Once mm-hmm. you're aware of it, it never goes away. Um, and so, that on the one hand with you know seeing what's happening in the world you know there's no way that they won't know and they've begun to have their own experiences um so we have been trying to do this gently in a way that um it's not too overwhelming for them because there no there aren't any solutions that these young children can have. It's not like we're saying, we're saying these are some very unfair things about the world. These are some very unfair ways in which you may be judged. There's nothing you can do about it. Correct. And that's Correct. a burden. And I think that seeing it now when, you know, there's also, we're in a pandemic and there's nothing that they can control about that. And then they're seeing these, these um, images. Well, my children have not seen those images of George Floyd, but some, some children have and there's nothing they can do about that. It becomes very, very overwhelming and not having tools to deal with those emotions is really right. challenging. So we've tried to gently start to have these conversations first in the context of difference, that there are a lot of different ways that when people are different, that they may be judged unfairly. And then moving from there to race, yes, it's done based on the color of your skin, and, and in other ways. So so we've tried to introduce it kind of mm-hmm. in a way that's not so overwhelming to them, quite frankly. Or steals their childhood. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think despite the fact that you may not know when is the right time and you're gently kind of pushing them along into some of what's considered reality, I think the mere fact of you guys being such great role models and example mm-hmm. of despite mm-hmm. You know, not despite, but you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer. You, I mean, you, you know, your husband's a medical doctor. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're a doctor. Your, you know, your, your siblings are, are doctors and lawyers, and and very successful in the business world. Your, your parents. So, I think we sometimes have to show our kids through example what they can become, knowing that society doesn't have those. Um, you know, those examples for them to see, you know, I mean, obviously we have a, a, a black a female vice president. We've had a black president. We're now starting to have these positive examples for our kids to see. So we don't have to have that conversation in the house hold, you know? So I yeah. think you guys are doing it the right way, doing it your way. And the best way is showing them that, you know, you can be whatever you want to be, you know, look at mom and dad, you know? So I just want, I, I just want to say, despite the fact that you may feel a little, you know, torn or uncertain about that conversation, you're leading by example as a mom. And that's great. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's definitely tough. And I think that people have to do what's best for them and what's best for their children. It's, it's not, that we can't, it's not that we can't or won't. It's just in a way that we think is, is okay for yes. each individual child. Each child is, is different. 
definitely. I appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Right. But, but that's kind of what we're about mothers, you know, talking about, you know, our experiences and you have, you know, experience that we love to hear about, you know, what you do and what you've been doing, you yeah. know, to educate the world about systemic racism in our healthcare. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. So I'd, I'd really like to hear about, you know, your work. Well, Donna, see, those are Donna's. Donna has a daughter, and those are also her children, as you can see. <laughs> so they will be part of this conversation and pop in every now and then and, and fully enjoy the, the, the moment and the conversation. So, um, yeah, so we're going to get to that. So just a little oh. bit of background. Go ahead, Donna. No, go ahead. Oh, okay, listening. just a little bit of background about what we want to show the audience. And I think oh, it's very, yes, very yes, important yes, yes. because uh, I, saw, I watched the entire presentation, and I thought your examples and your graphics were really spot mm -hmm. on. And if you had any doubt that racism exists and developed a long, very long time ago, and it's still prevalent in every aspect of society, including healthcare and health, you will not, you will, you will no longer have a question about that. I think your presentation was spot on. So we're going to show snippets of that presentation and also ask you to kind of elaborate and maybe have this more of a discussion about it. But there were several areas that I, I definitely want to highlight. Um, one was historical basis for race and racism in the U.S., uh, individual and systemic systemic impact on Black America, the cliff of good health, which I thought was phenomenal, and um, what does racial health look like? Well, w one thing I really, really liked a lot was um, the the genetic zip code, mm. you know, Hmm. Spot yeah. on. Yeah. You know, you know, your zip code means more to you than your genetics. Yes. Hello. Yes. And, and, the, and the redlining. Redlining. Red, redlining is alive and well. If anyone doesn't think that, they're mistaken. Right. Yeah. And and uh, you know, our platform not only provides conversation but resources for mothers. And I think your presentation is a great resource for mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. anyone trying to change or. or, or I don't. I don't want to say having to prove to themselves that racism exists because you have to be pretty ignorant to not know that it does. But there are obviously are some people out there, and we want to change those hearts and those minds. Yeah. And I think your presentation should be shared. Um, we shared it on our web on our Facebook page, mm -hmm. and I think after mm -hmm. we're done, I'm also going to highlight it again and share it. But you you were spot on on so many things, and that's the reason why I wanted you to start with who you are because. You, you're credible, you give some very, very credible information. And after our discussion for the last 23 minutes, no one should doubt what you have to say. Not only have you lived it, but you're educated about it and you're doing a great job trying to change um, the systemic racism that exists in, the, in your profession. And um, you know, I definitely think that's great. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, and before you pull it up, I'll just say one thing, part of the motivation for this and even, you know, very well educated people in medicine, you know, have not appreciated the difference between individual and systemic or structural racism. So understanding how racism a lot is alive in the United States yes. today. Yes, there are individual one on one experiences, but there is a fabric uh, an infrastructure in this country in which racism is interwoven so deeply that the vestiges are here in, in every everywhere we look. And I think right. there's, and people, people have a hard time separating the personal, I'm not a racist from this is the institution in which we live. So I just wanted to add that before. That's right. Okay, excellent. So this one, first part was gonna be, is um, it's gonna be about the historical basis for race and racism in the US. So I'm going ahead, gonna go ahead and play that for our audience. So we are all very well aware of America's history of slavery, and it feels very unfair to, to try and compress this oppression briefly into one slide. But this overview really is foundational for the conversation today. We all know that Blacks were in, enslaved legally in this country from the 1600s to the mid 1860s um, until uh, the end of the Civil War and the 13th Amendment. Uh, was ratified. But the next 100 years 
after the end of the Civil War and the 13th Amendment were characterized by a period that's described here on this graph by Jim Crow and segregation. During this period, race was defined by the one drop rule. If you had one drop of black blood in your, in your lineage, you were considered uh, black. And during this period, um, codes or laws that were called the black codes or black laws followed by Jim, Jim Crow laws actually in, es in essence criminal criminalized blackness. Um, so at this point, um, enslaved individuals were freed, but freedmen had many rules placed on them during this period. For, for instance, freedmen couldn't assemble with whites without being fined or imprisoned. Freedmen were assumed to be farmers, and if they were not farmers, they, they were uh, uh, enforced a tax that they had to pay annually of anywhere from 10 to $100, so penalized for being anything other than a farmer. Freedmen were not to be taught to, to read or write. Of course, we know that public facilities were segregated, and violators of these laws, whether the, the Black Codes, Black Laws, or Jim Crow laws, were subject to being whipped, branded, fined, and imprisoned. And many um, legal scholars really see this, these Jim Crow laws and this, this post-slavery era um, as the kind of basis for mass incarceration among uh, Blacks and people of color that we still see legacies of today. This period was also characterized by redlining, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about throughout. Um, that's very, another very important uh, trend. After the Jim Crow and segregation era, which really came to an end formally through the passing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, we now find ourselves in this period of racial inequity, where we still see a ver very palpable and concrete effects of ongoing structural racism. And that's what I hope to really um, paint some clear pictures of today. So during this history um, in the U.S. where slavery was, was legal and, and justified in the eyes of, of the U.S. Uh, of the citizens of the day, there were also growing fields in science that were really used to justify this cultural oppression. One famous physician from Philadelphia, Samuel Morton, um, actually described, he used a field uh, termed craniology to argue that whites were racially superior and had the greatest intellectual capacity because they had the biggest skulls to, to house the biggest brains. This human skull collection is even displayed to this day at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and he was heralded by the Charleston Medical Journal in South Carolina for giving the Negro his true position as an inferior race. Another um, important uh, scientist of this time, Frederick Ludwig Hoffman, was a statistician. He was employed by a Prudential Life Insurance Company, and in 1896, he published this 330-page article entitled Race, Traits, and Tendencies of the American Negro, with the rationale that only by means of a thorough analysis of all the data that make up the history of this race uh, in this country can the true nature of the so-called Negro problem be understood. His true motivation was to prove to his employer, Prudential Life, that the American Negro was uninsurable. He laid out in this, in this long manuscript that Negroes died more because they were inferior and they were inferior because they died more. He failed to take into account many of the important factors that we'll talk about today called the structural determinants of health, because it was true that American Negroes did die more relative to others, but they also lived in unsafe uh, living conditions that were crowded and did not have access to medical care, just to name a few. Negroes did die more, Negroes did die more. I think you're muted, Dania. Sorry, <laughs> I said a lot to unpack there. Oh, uh, you know, and I, I just did want to talk about the first part of that presentation, which kind of was a timeline of, you know, from 1641 all the way to the present time <coughs> of, of 
slavery, you know, um, different form in different form in different forms in different ways, but still to this day continues. And I want you to kind of talk about that part of the presentation yeah. first. I think that you know this is some of what I was saying before. I think when a lot, even today, um, when people hear the word racism, this is what many people think. You know, of that the slavery era the post-slavery era Jim Crow, mm -hmm. where there was great segregation, where there, we're thinking of race as an, uh, the individual de uh, definition, where people um, think that there's an inherent superiority of a particular race. And this is what drove and justified a lot of the legacy of slavery and the post-slavery era. But and then set up the system, like I said, that we have that we have now. Um, but I think that we all know, any minority knows today that the experience of racism in the United States, yes, sometimes it's overt, sometimes it's covert. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then there is the system, the systematic stuff that we talked about, the structural determinants that that are what lead us to this conversation about why are we seeing racial disparities everywhere we turn? Why do we see racial disparities in COVID-19 infections and deaths and HIV and heart disease or whatever disease you want to name it, at least from, from a medical person's perspective? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important to know that, yes, we've come a long way in trying to dispel um, some of the, the science of the day that really was what I think developed to justify the process. Yes. Slavery, right? Which was a that this was a purely economic benefit to the American South, um, and so that science developed around the practice, and it justified the behaviors that 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 people were taking to continue to um, to enslave individuals. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I and I found it interesting that even after slavery was abolished, the Jim Crow laws was a different form of slavery. It was, yeah, it, it was certainly a different form of slavery and um, really allowed, especially in the Southern states between Jim Crow and the black, the black codes to, like I said, criminalize blackness, right. you know, in a very real way. Um, you know, you can't move two steps without doing something that could actually be penalized criminally by mm -hmm. you know, whether it was um, being thrown in jail or fined. So even though you now have this title of being free, you're not free at all. You're very far from being free. Right. And, and it may actually make it difficult for you to have any economic freedom because you can't actually move from place to place freely to have a job or move from place to place freely to do the work that you want to do if it's not a far, you know, farming if you have another opportunity. So, so very constraining and p putting people in a position where they continue to be deprived economically and socially. Right, and then post that period of time after the Civil Rights Act, now you have the racial inequalities that exactly. you mentioned. So tell us a little bit about what those are. And that's up until the present time. So you went from slavery to the Jim Crow laws to now the yeah. racial inequalities. What, what are those racial inequalities? Yeah, and so th these are, I think any field that you're in, I'm in medicine, so this is how I think about this medicine and public health. And so, so whether you want to think about this from medicine, the medicine route, education, uh, the criminal justice system, you know, housing, I think, housing, housing, yeah, yes. any, any field, you see these vestiges, right. and I think that there, even you know, when we look at tests of implicit bias, mm -hmm. we know that these are in our deep subconscious. Even people of color have been indoctrinated to have these implicit biases of Correct. associations between black violence and black and criminality. So this is kind of seeped into our culture in such an ingrained way. Um, but yes, the, the inequalities that we see, you know, first it's very, very covert, very obvious. People are enslaved. They're not even looked at as full people, as humans. Um, and then even in the post the post-racial area, we now have a system that has been built to, that doesn't allow us full capacity, doesn't allow us full opportunity. We don't, whether it's access to education, access to wealth building, access to healthcare, it's pervasive, you know? So we can't, 
now today look at our country and say, oh yeah, it must be that Blacks have uh, more COVID cases because there's something inherently genetically different about Blacks. No, it's not. It's all of the determinants that have been set up by this long legacy that preceded today. Yeah. So you see, you know, that that saying that, you know, a system a system is built to give the exact result that it's built to achieve. And that's that's what we have. We have the result that this system was built to achieve, which that's is right. racial inequities. That's right. That's right. And we'll go into a little bit of those, too, as well. But Donna, I know you're on mute. You, you have anything to add before I move on to the next thing? OK, so the next part of your presentation, and this was a presentation for the Coalition of Justice, correct? Yes, this is the okay. for Justice, founded by uh, Dr. Ahonkai, Dr. Bernadine Ahonkai. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, similarly, after, after the, uh, George Floyd's murder, she was really motivated to um, start an organization that could have conversations like this about race and racism and equity and what that looks like in the United States today. Now your audience was, was quite diverse and I, I thought that was good. You know, what, what makes up her uh, following? Yeah, I think that the following started locally in Pennsylvania where she is, but it grew um, after they were um, selected by the Biden campaign um, right. featured during inauguration week. Um, and so a lot more people learned about the coalition at that time and the, the membership grew across the US. So wonderful. it's a wonderful platform for education and advocacy um, for these topics of racial equity and social justice. Great, and I, I just wanted the audience to know that this presentation was shared to um, that membership and you know shared across the country, like you said, and the audience was very diverse. So I know you had an opportunity, opportunity, opportunity like we do, to change some hearts and minds based on some of the the evidence and and um, you know facts that you were presenting. So you know I thought that was good work. Um, the next part of it was the individual and systemic impact on Black America, um, and I thought you again laid out very specific examples of this being pervasive in Black America. And I think some people don't understand how it affects us or they don't want to understand how it affects us, but you made it quite clear. So I'm going to go ahead and, and add that part um, to the conversation. Um, let me just find More it. Relative to other uh, So it's... Into right. the individual and systemic impact of this historical uh, history of racism on Black Americans. So first, let's talk about the case of redlining. I talked a little bit about this when we looked at the, that timeline of American history. Redlining describes discriminatory practices that, that denied access to credit and insurance for borrowers in, neighbors, in neighborhoods that were economically disadvantaged or had high percentages of minorities in them. Um, these occurred on the heels of the housing shortages in the New Deal era. And so what happened is that surveyors um, from home lending companies, in conjunction with the Federal Housing uh, Administration and then later the Veterans Administration, actually surveyed all of the metropolitan areas in the country. And what they did was look at a number of factors, including the, the areas where there was a high density of African-Americans or proximity to a high density of African-Americans. And when they mapped out these regions, they designated these areas with a uh, high proportion of African-Americans as very undesirable. This led to uh, several circumstances that really um, uh, ha have facilitated long-term racial segregation. This underwriting was actually um, indoctrinated um, it legally because in the FHA's underwriting agreements, there was a clause that said that this was totally appropriate because um, of incompatible, uh, they wanted to avoid, avoid incompatible racial and social. Um, this also led to segregated real estate markets with different rates of appreciation and, and capacity for building wealth or generating equity for white people versus black or Hispanic people. This is really critical when we think about um, uh, what this means today. 
Um, African American incomes are about 60% those of white incomes, but African American wealth is about 5% that of whites. Um, and most middle class families gain their wealth from home equity. So policies like this are thought to be directly responsible for a large proportion of that equity gap that we see today. And this practice of redlining really continued until the Fair Housing Act uh, was signed in 1968. But as I'll show you, we still see vestiges of it today. So why? You know, people are like, well, what are you talking about? You have the same opportunities we have. You have the same opportunity to gain wealth for your families. Why aren't you doing it? And one of the one thing you said in that segment was wealth is attained through real estate sometimes, you know, and the fact that our due to redlining, our properties of, of low value exactly. and we can't continue that, you know, that system of, of generational wealth, one system of generational wealth, because we are, you know, segregated and, and, and put into a box where our communities and our housing are just not worthy of hmm. that type of opportunity. So do you want to explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I think that, you know, this this story of redlining is fascinating and not only this, this, the, the historical part of it, but the legacy of it is even more fascinating. Um, and yeah, like, like I said in the clip, this was really um, born out of, you know, born out of that individualized racism and saying that we don't want to insure mortgages where black people are living because it's too risky. Why is it too risky? You have to have a lot of assumptions about mm -hmm. blackness to say that insuring mor mortgages for black people are too risky. So, and, and those the same same criteria were applied to things where, you know, if this is a big kind of factory ridden area, we wouldn't insure mortgages for private homes. Um, and so it wasn't only blackness that made it risky. It was other things that would not be conducive to residential living. Right. So, so and, and like I said, this was fully indoctrinated in kind of the underwriting clauses for the Federal Housing Administration and it and and then later the Veterans Administration. And so this this is this was through no fault of your own. You could be doing everything right, you know as a minority and trying to do the things that you know are supposed to bring your family prosperity and wealth over time. Um, but you are, are redlined, literally, you know, literally X'd out of mm -hmm. this opportunity um, for no other reason than, you know, by, by the color of your skin. Um, and so people who don't understand this history, um, you know, when we see, like you mentioned, Donna, um, you know, I think you show a clip about it later on, the importance of where you live determining your health mm -hmm. outcomes, your mm -hmm. educational outcomes, opportunities for the future. This is exactly where it comes from. This is the basis of that. Um, and it was clearly set out by the Federal Housing Administration. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. History. But, but, you know, I recently saw something that, you know, equally as pervasive, that appraisers, when they um, would value um, houses of black families lower than white families, even in the same zip code, just based upon, and so people were, what, what was it, Daniel, didn't, did we do this? And yeah, then they were taking, they, they, taking down the black photographs, lower, black were, posters, unblocking their house. What were they? They, they would, had they a word lower, for it. Yeah, they would lower the value of the home because right, it was, the appraisers were doing the appraisers this. Lower, yeah. So, so when they, they so they yeah. had to yeah, take down all their Evidence. anything that that would right. show that they were a black family in order to get the appraisal to be you know where it probably should have been. <laughs> yeah, right. So right, and, and and they did this. They did this very scientifically, and it was you know. They were spot on. I can't. I couldn't believe that. Where did? Who's that, Junior? Uh, one of our one of our guests did mention yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, it's a combination of the structural and the implicit. You know, and it's, and it's still continuing today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, despite. Uh, here's another clip that I, I, I that I want to show too and give you an opportunity to discuss. 
68, a little bit of time talking about the personal. Um, what is the experience of living while Black in the United States? And I'm, I'm really happy that we are in a place um, in our country now when we can have these conversations um, more honestly. Um, these data come from uh, the, the Pew Foundation, which conducts all of these uh, uh, polls on social trends. But this report was on race in the United States in 2019. And when they surveyed Black people, they found that 74% say that race is central to their overall identity. 52% said that, uh, they, that being Black has hurt their ability to get ahead. 76% say that they have personally experienced racism. 65% say that people have acted like they were suspicious of them. 60% say that people acted like they thought they weren't smart. And 44% say they were unfairly stopped by the police. What I want to emphasize here is this is the experience of Blacks in America, period. Um, my sister was kind enough to, to, uh, to share a little bit of my, my pedigree and my training. And what I can say is, as a Black female physician, there is not a day when I see patients in the hospital that I'm not mistaken for a nurse. Fine, I'm a female. More nurses are female. I, I don't think twice about it, but there's not a day when I'm rounding on patients in the hospital that I'm not mistaken for environmental services, housekeeping services. It doesn't matter if I'm wearing a white coat. It doesn't matter if I'm wearing a stethoscope. It doesn't matter if I'm wearing a name tag that says Dr. Ahunkai. But these are the explicit and implicit experiences that we are having on a day-to-day -day basis. And what is the impact of that? So there are people who are currently um, trying to really quantify what the impact is of living with racism. The stresses that come from dealing with daily micro or macro aggressions, um, does that have health consequences? And, and we're starting to see that it does. Um, I've referenced this New England Journal article here, which describes a couple of studies looking at the impact of living with racial experience, uh, living with racial discrimination. Uh, showing increases um, in brain disease on MRI, increased inflammation of blood vessels, and poor kidney function over time, just to name a few. Truly amazing. <laughs> truly, truly, truly amazing. I mean, just the story of you sometimes in the hospital, as brilliant as you are, and I'll run, it, run down it again for our latecomers, okay? Trained at undergraduate at Harvard, Medical degree from John, Johns Hopkins University. Masters in public health as well from John Hopkins University. Your residency at Harvard. And now an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee and Vanderbilt. And you still get confused as being a nurse. Oh, no, no, housekeeper. House, I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's just so sad. It's so sad. You know, it, it's just so unfortunate. But yeah. talk a little bit about, about that. You know, I think whoever you are, if you're a person of color in this country, there are assumptions being made about you on an ongoing basis. And that this idea of living while black is you is we we all understand, we all understand this. You know, I remember talking to a colleague um, at Vanderbilt who is a white woman about this, and she was so enraged. And I, you know, and I'm just kind of watching her reaction and I was like, wow, I mean, it's frustrating, but if I get enraged every time this happens, I would be enraged every, right. time, you know, and, and this is a little thing. This is not being pulled over and beaten by the police, you know, so relatively speaking, okay, fine, you know. I'm still a doctor, whether or not you think I am, it's still here, I still have the evidence of that. So I think that um, it, it's powerful, but it also explains, I saw uh, someone posted this image on Facebook the other day, and I'm sure it's circulating, that um, being black is an exhausting, living with microaggressions is exhausting, living mm -hmm. with macroaggressions is exhausting, living with structural racism is exhausting, 
I, th I found that very interesting because I think that there is, there is a tax, a burden of, you know, existing through all of this. And like we talked about earlier, balancing that with bringing your best self to every encounter so that no one can poke holes in what it is you're bringing to the table. That's, That's right. As well, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it, it's, it can be very frustrating. I mean, I right. had to find a way to navigate that so that I could take care of my patients. Um, but it's not, it's not the only, it's not the only micro or macro aggression I'll encounter. And um, I still have to persist. Right. And, and one so, of the things you said just real quick is at the end of that, not only do we have to be worried, we have to worry about being killed by police officers or, or anything, but now being black and dealing with all these micro and macro aggressions, it's also killing us physically. Our health is ailing because of the stress of dealing with yeah. all of this. And what kind of health issues, I know you, you mentioned them in the slides, but can you go over them again? Yeah, so this is, this is an area that's just um, kind of starting to get more attention. What is the, actually the physiologic impact of my body of dealing with ongoing racism? So people have looked at kind of the, the stress hormone in the body, cortisol levels, um, higher levels of that can be associated with inflammation. Um, they've seen increases in kind of evidence of disease, uh, of, of the diseases that cause strokes on imaging in the brain mm -hmm. um, and people who are reporting more um, experiences with racism. Um, so inflammation around the blood vessels, strokes, kidney disease, all things that we know um, are associated with chronic diseases that increase your mortality. Right. And so I think that this is a growing field to recognize what is what is the burden of all of this on yes. us? Because I think if we talk to among ourselves as Black people, we know that there's a burden. We feel it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and not only do we feel it, but honestly, before now, before conversations like this, we just kept it inside and maybe we talked to with each other, but we didn't talk about it in the mainstream. We have to look our best and be our best selves. But so it's really important. It's really important though to talk about it. Yeah. It has to be out there. And I think that's changed post George Floyd. Honestly, I think more and more people are feeling comfortable talking about racism and, and discriminate discriminatory behaviors and things that they've experienced in their lives because more people are listening, number one, and there are platforms like this to talk about it, you yeah. know? So before that, it was taboo. You don't say anything about that. And that I think is what you're referring to, holding it all in when you know you've been wronged, when you know you've been, it's, the bias is against you because of your color and you can't say anything, whether you didn't get that job and you were well qualified or you didn't get that loan and you, you, know, you were qualified for that, or you didn't get the benefit of the doubt when you were stopped by the police or you were harassed simply because of the color of your skin and you have to take all that anger and, and hold it in and you can't talk about it. You can, and you have to be strong, whether it's for your family, you know, for your children, for your community, you have to be strong and, and kind of talk yourself out of this even happening to you. And on the inside, it's completely destroying you and breaking you down in terms of your health. And this was post George Floyd. We're talking about a couple of months ago. We're not talking about years ago. Exactly. We're talking about a couple of months ago. Now, if you're not talking about racism, something's wrong with you. You know, yeah. if you're not standing up for it, if you're not talking about the experiences of it, or if you're not trying to make change, whether it's in the legislation or, you know, any facets of society, if you're not actively trying to make the change, something's not wrong with you. So I think that hopefully the tables have, has, have turned in terms of just that, that awareness. That awareness, and thank you for platforms like this to, to have that discussion because I do mm -hmm. think that that is a palpable difference. Um, I there are so many pockets of this country of ours where there's still a very vigorous pushback of there's there's no racism here. What are you Hi. talking about? Yes. So um, the more people that can kind of oh like you said, have a little bit of empathy, a little bit of openness to seeing, well, this is not a condemnation of an individual. Right. This is looking critically at, at our, our system, mm -hmm. structures in our, our country. Right. There are individuals who are racist and hold racist beliefs, but 
that's that's not most of what we're talking about, you know. So, but right. they, but for many white people, they don't even know they're racist, or they they don't even. It's it's um, so ingrained. It's so subtle. It's so, you know, like we had one show just on vocabulary, mm -hmm. just on words. The master bedroom suite. The master bedroom. Remember that one? Just the the master yeah. bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Where did that come from? You know, <laughs> Black Friday. Yeah, and that's why it's just so good to have these conversations, mm -hmm. just to bring awareness to it. And you know, there are, like you said, there are some people who just are unaware of the fact that they may be perceived as, as racist based on their behavior or their vocabulary or just by their complacency alone. Right. You know, so awareness like this. And that's why I thought your presentation was so important because it's backed up by facts and evidence yes. and visuals, you exactly. know, and it's one thing for us, Donna and I, to sit here every week and talk about it, you know, but it's it's coming from a place that's been studied and, and, and educated and lived. And it just brings some sort of credibility to it all. And hopefully, with you know, we'll continue to share it, like we said. But I do want to continue because there's so much good stuff in this presentation. And, um, you know, I just want to make sure I, I really share this with the audience because I'm not ending this show until I know I've done everything I can with bringing awareness to what you share with the justice, the Coalition for Justice um, in your presentation, because I may not have the attention of someone like this ever again. And I just want to make sure I do this, this call of due diligence with oh, this we're, presentation. We're, we're, we'll get her back. She likes us. Huh? <laughs> For me? Yeah, <laughs> I'm all for this. All right, so here's another part of it all. Hold on, folks. Put on your seatbelts. It's getting better. So most of us have lived through the trauma of George Floyd's murder. And I have to admit that to this day, I have not been able to watch this video. I have two black sons pictured here, I have a black husband, I have a black father, I have a black brother in my immediate family. And I am not capable of even conceiving of watching that video without seeing their faces. What I do know is that my husband and I have had to talk to our eight-year-old son about why he can't wear a hoodie. We've had to start to talk to him about why people may falsely misjudge him. And when I've seen images of the protests for George Floyd, what strikes me most and wrenches my heart is the images of these young children who are adorable as children are um, today. Um, but we wonder tomorrow, will they be perceived as a threat and by whom? We know that racial and ethnic minorities have a higher risk of being killed at the hands of the police. And I'll show you the data that really supports that assertion. So here it is. Black men have a one in 1,000 chance of being killed by the police in their lifetime. Just let that sink in for a moment. One in 1,000 chance of being killed in their lifetime. So the researchers who looked at this data um, published it just last year and looked at public data on police-involved deaths deaths to estimate this risk. And what they found, you can see in the table here, um, for African Americans, as I said, 96 and 100,000, about one in 1,000 lifetime risk. For American Indian Alaskan Native, about ha almost half that, 60, uh, 60 per 100,000. Latinx, 53 per 100,000. When we compare that to whites, it's about 39 per 100,000. And the lowest risk was for Asian and Pacific Islanders. So we have a lot of work to do in this country. And it's, it, this risk is highest uh, between the ages of 20 and 30, uh, 35 years for all groups. Um, and so when I think about this as I'm preparing young men to be young men uh, and hope that they have a future uh, to attain, um, this is part of what inspires me. Wow, one in 1,000 chance of being killed by the police. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, 
there's no mother of a black child that is not, you know, the, the, I think the images of the children during the protests and the images of the mothers were the ones that broke me mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I had my kids up on that screen. My youngest is three. And I heard your voice cracking too. Voice. Yeah, because yeah. they're cute. And, oh, they're so cute. They're so cute until they're not cute. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they're a threat. And I know, you know this, Dana, you have boys. It's to think that there's nothing these kids can do to prevent and that and that's that's what I remember. My dad, you, you know, talked to us about street smarts. You know, we're like, yeah. oh, street smarts. What do you do? You know, we all had that conversation, even as young girls. What do you do when you're stopped by the police? We know it doesn't matter. You could do everything right and be from some glowing background. It truly, it truly doesn't matter. That may not save you. And um, so, it, it is. It's it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And I think. We saw that. I mean, I think we saw like a psychic cry, you know, from our country, especially, you know, the call for your mother. We're supposed to protect our children. Yes. You know? Donna? Yeah. Yeah, oh. I'm here. Isn't this not why we started this? That is oh. exactly why we started this, because if you... You know, and I understand why you did not watch the video oh. of George Floyd, oh. but there's a very meaningful oh. part that struck Daniel and myself. And when you heard him cry for his mother, how could you not be touched? Any mother, you know, you know it was heart wrenching. And that was the catalyst for us to do what we're doing today, mm -hmm. you know, to talk. And for me as a mother, oh. um, you know, I recently, oh. I think it's going to be up to us mothers in many ways to educate and to stand up for all children. Mm -hmm. And I recently got myself into a little bit of trouble by, oh. um, <laughs> Dave, oh. don't stop. Me. <laughs> I want her to share the story. <laughs> so I, 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 I was striving and there was a state police officer had a young a young man of color pulled over and the hood was up, the trunk was up, the doors are open and the young man sitting on the guardrail, you know, on his phone, he's typing away. And I said, okay. So I turned around and I just pulled up and I just sat there and just watched and just waited, waited for this to stop. So I ended up getting a ticket. <laughs> the police officer was very angry with me. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just sitting, just watching. And um, he didn't like it. And I ended up getting a ticket for it. And um, who cares? But, you know, I, 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 I just knew that he just kept searching for something to get this kid on. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted him to drive away. And the thing about it, it wasn't her child. Yes. But it was Everybody's someone's child. child. It was someone's child. And I know her mother, his mother is somewhere probably not knowing what's going on with her son. But mm -hmm. in that moment, needed another mother to step in and say, not on my watch. Yes. Not, not today. That's you know, and yeah. that is what we have to do for each other. You know, that, that's what we have to do for our children. You know, and um, I always say, you know, I want to change the hearts and minds of the white upper class or middle class women who are raising their children. Because unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to see, it, those children will be the decision makers the CEOs, the, ba the, the bankers, you know, the ones who are going to decide whether we and our children are qualified and capable and deserving of so many things. So if there is a ounce of diversity that's brought into that, that child's upbringing yeah. at that age and knowledge of others and respect others despite so many, that child will turn, into be, turn out to be a better person and will break the systemic racism that exists for yeah. our children. So I, we do this for that reason. We do this to change the hearts and the minds of mothers everywhere who are raising children because we, not, we can't do anything about the last 400 years. You know, We have to do something about the future and it takes conversation like this to make that happen and, and continually spreading the history, the history of all of this. Now you spent a lot of time in your presentation, not a lot of time, you spent the, 
you're in your presentation up until this point talking about the history of racism and the impact on being black in America. And then you transition to the health aspect of it all, because obviously that's your field and you witness that every single day. And I wanna show the um, good cliff of health. And I want you to talk about that because, you know, we've had plenty of people on that talked about, you know, we had the, um, the mayor of Gloucester on, we've had um, the representative from Massachusetts, um, Lori um, Trahan, and the, those were legislation, legislation, legislators. We've had lawyers on, we've had educators on, you know, we we had police officers, just people in all different parts yeah. of society that see it every single day, and it's pervasive in those areas. But now we have you on, who's taking it from the lens of a of a medical professional, right. and seeing how racism affects the health and lack of health care, proper health care for black and brown people. And you tied it all in, obviously, to the COVID nineteen, but it's in you know, obviously, with all the other diseases and that are out there, we are the ones who are dying from this. We are the ones that are not getting the proper care, the proper medical health, uh, me me proper medication because, and I'll let you, you know, continue to continue to explain that, but uh, I definitely want to show the good cliff, the cliff of good health. And it's, if you, I keep saying, if you don't get it by now, every show I say it, but okay, <laughs> people, if you don't get it by now, by this animation, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and play that as well. Okay. All right. So now. Tamara Phyllis Jones, past president of the American Public Health Association. You may have heard the saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. When it comes to health and well-being, preserving health is always best. But there's more to the story. Imagine that someone is walking along and whoops, they have just fallen off the cliff of good health. And if that were you, you'd be relieved to find an ambulance at the bottom to speed you on to health care. But what else can we do to protect you? How about a net to catch people? But nets have holes, so some people may still fall through and the net is likely to rip over time. What else can we do? Clearly, we need to build a fence at the top of the cliff to keep people from falling in the first place. But if a lot of people are near the edge of the cliff, even a really strong fence will not be enough. To keep everyone safe, we need to move all the people away from the edge of the cliff. We do that by addressing the drivers of poor health that go beyond our genes and beyond our personal behaviors. Things like low wages and under-resourced schools and unsafe housing. The environments in which we live, work, and play shape our health. These are the social determinants of health. These things can either propel people toward the cliff's edge or keep them at a safe distance from it. But this cliff analogy is incomplete. We need to also realize that the cliff is really three-dimensional. And then to notice that resources and people are not evenly distributed along this cliff. At some parts of the cliff, the ambulance at the bottom may have a flat tire, or maybe there's no ambulance there at all. Maybe there's no net, nor fence. And usually, at those parts of the cliff, the people are being pushed closer to the edge. These are the differences that lead to health disparities in a population. Differences in the speed and quality of the ambulances represent differences in quality of care. Differences in the presence of ambulances, nets, or fences, these represent differences in access to care. And differences in the distance to the edge of the cliff represent differences in the opportunities and exposures and stressors that make some people in communities sicker than others. We need to ask a lot of questions. Why is the cliff three-dimensional? Why do some parts of the cliff lack ambulances or nets or fences? And why are some people being pushed closer to the edge? 
it's because our economic system fails to provide an even playing field. It's because racism, which is foundational to our nation's history, is still with us and continues to cause profound harm to us all. And because discrimination against people of color, women, immigrants, the LGBTQ community, poor people and others, holds back our nation's health and well-being. Everyone should have the opportunity to achieve good health. If we try to address the social determinants of health without tackling these bigger systems of structured inequity like racism and sexism, we risk moving some people away from the cliff's edge, but not others. We risk making health disparities worse. Experts at the Urban Institute Sorry, I keep doing that. <laughs> But that was very, very visual and very, you know, self-explanatory. Um, yeah, I love, um, I love that analogy. And Kamara Jones, um, like she said, she's the immediate press, past president of the American Public Health Association, dynamic African American female physician and leader. She came up with that um, allegory. Um, well, she published it back in two thousand and nine. So this is well before people were really the not people i mean many people were thinking about it but not the whole country you know um and i and i think it's so important to use this time where we see everyone can see the the differences in in what different racial and ethnic groups are experiencing with covid-19 is in front of us. And, mm -hmm. you know, through the first part of this pandemic, there was nothing else for us to see, you know, we're all on our screens and watching the numbers and we could see, yeah, this thing is affecting uh, minority communities more than it is majority communities. Well, why is that? And so I think while some people are stunned to learn about it, those of us in public health who've been dealing with and thinking about chronic diseases um, or other acute diseases, these things are not new. You know the thing, the yeah. structural determinants of health that are got, that that are driving all of these um, racial disparities. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I love this allegory. It's a it's a nice visual. Right. And the last part of your presentation that I want to address for the sake of um, our time and Donna, Donna, you looks like you look like you're falling asleep on us. Donna, no, it's I'm way good. past her bedtime. <laughs> no, I'm I'm good. I'm I, I get up at four thirty. So <laughs> you're just like days. just like my husband. He's probably knocked out somewhere. <laughs> um, but we just got a few more. Um, the last part I wanted to address was um, what does rat what does racial health look like? And um, I just want to show a couple of slides uh, from your presentation about that. Our explorer. health condition US US that rivals those in developing countries in minority communities increased risk of diabetes so this is not all because blacks are inferior right we've established I'm sorry outcomes uh, racial and ethnic disparities are pervasive they we can look at almost any health condition and see these disparities. I'm an HIV uh, physician. We see increased risk of contracting HIV in minority communities. We see increased risk of death from heart disease in minority communities. We see rates of maternal and infant mortality in some places in the US that rivals those in developing countries in minority communities, increased risk of diabetes. So this is not all because blacks are inferior, right? We've established that. This is not all because of genetic predispositions. We've established that. We know that this is a system that we have created in the US and this system has given us this very imperfect result. And so the questions that we have to ask are how do we begin to address this system? And I'm gonna go ahead and add some more to this as well so we could have a full discussion. This is minorities in the COVID-19 era. This is where the discomfort comes in. We can say, you know, let's make it equal. 
And this, this pictorial here is the assumption that everyone benefits from the same supports, right? Everyone gets one stool, one crate to stand on, and, and will have the same view. And that's clearly not the case, right? This little short guy over here is out of luck. Equity moves that one step further. It says everyone gets the support that they need to produce equity. So this little guy can see above the fence. Now he has two, two crates. We're moving towards equity. How do we get to justice? Justice says that all three can see the game without supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was addressed. This time, the systemic barrier was the fence uh, or the opaque fence, which has been removed. So now, I thought that was a great, great illustration of where we are today. You know, I think where we are today is in the justice phase. How can we tear down the, that, that fence, right? And make it equal for all. So that way we don't have to do different things to make, you know, make, make equality or make it equ equ equitable, correct? I right. thought that was a great analogy. Yeah, I love that image because it makes it really clear, um, you know, what we're talking about, yeah. what we mean by equity and what we mean by justice, what the difference is. Correct. Equity is not always the solution, right? I mean, I think even there's still a lot of debate around equity, right? You know, I told you my story with the with the affirmative action baby into Harvard, right? Right. But, um, but even further, thinking about what it takes for us to get to a point of, of justice when we're talking about social determinants of health, you know, what one of the things I said in the presentation is that it moves us into a place of discomfort. So even if we're saying, yes, African Americans are at higher risk of COVID-19, African Americans are more likely to die from COVID-19, um, should African Americans get <clears throat> their vaccines first? That's another story, you know. What, what, what was that? We missed that. Should Af what was that? Should African Americans also get vaccinated first? Correct. If they have higher risk of getting the disease and higher risk of death if they get the disease. Should they get their vaccines before for whites with similar risks? Well, and so, well, based upon what my how my doctor explained to me, the the pe person who's going to end up sickest and in the hospital needs to because I didn't understand why smokers got to go in front <laughs> for me, and she explained it's not about that. It said if they get it, they're going to be in the hospital. So that's it. Go on the science. You know, I was mad about smokers, but you yeah. know, you go by the science. Who's going to get sickest first? You know, who's going to take up that that hospital space? That's yeah. who has to go. Yeah. I mean, but despite all of this discussion and, and knowledge about about the legacy, the structural racism driving the inequities, are the way we've approached vaccine rollout does not take race into account, and so mm -hmm. I think that. It's it's and, and not only that, but you know what what we're seeing in many cases, anecdotally and some um, more than anecdotally, is that the that that there's truly limited access to vaccines in minority communities, and or it may be being usurped by my majority communities. Mm -hmm. So um, there is so much opportunity for us to try to create a system that can get this closer to right than wrong. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is this is the the time for us to do that, you know, Amen. in a way that impacts everyone. Yes, this we can't even get out of this pandemic if we don't find a way to do this in a way that impacts everyone. That's right. That's right. And and that justice, it not only, you know, your example of of justice in the healthcare system, but justice in education, justice in housing, mm -hmm. justice in so many different. Mm -hmm. you know, areas that it just is continuing to hold us back despite, you know, all the attempts for, for equity, you know, until we, we, and I, and I want to really bring this home until we realize we need to break down this system that has been part of our American culture or society or history for so long, we would not, we will not eradicate racism. It's, it's more destroying and this breaking down and, and, and rebuilding um, of so many different things that just could provide justice mm -hmm. for all, you know? And, and I thought that that, that, re that really um, brought home the point that sometimes we're looking at the wrong things, you know, and yeah. focusing on the wrong things and thinking, well, you know, I gave you an opportunity, why can't you make the best of it? Well, you know, so, um, but, you know, this has been a, gr a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, I'm yeah. being here. Thank you for having me. I think we're going to need a part two, Dania. Yeah, <laughs> we sure will need a part two. And hopefully the part two will be about justice and reform and well, um, so you know, many other things. Yes, yes, because that's where, you know, what we haven't spoken about it, and then up and the whole another show is how do we fix this? Yes. How do we, what, what do we do? Yes. I mean, you gave us, you told us how it is. How mm -hmm. do we fix it? Yeah. And it starts in the school system, you know, oh, no. educating, I, educating. I, 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 I want to hear, you know, but I. Oh, yeah, that was a question for Ima. Okay, I'm. Well, you know, I think that, like you were saying, Dania, if you look at this from, you know, the bird's eye view, it's 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 actually overwhelming, you know, mm -hmm. because it's so pervasive. And mm -hmm. you know, you can think about health, you can think about education, you can think about legal justice uh, um, reform, mm -hmm. criminal justice reform. So I look at this through through my lane and through my lens, and we we all have an opportunity through which to do that. So um, so I say to people, figure out what you are most passionate about, and have that be the place that you make a change. Okay. You know, if your kids are like my kids are in elementary school, and we are advocating for them to bring in a consultant to think about diversity and inclusion in the school for training teachers and making sure the curricula are appropriate, then advocate at the school. Mm -hmm. you know, there are opportunities for everyone mm -hmm. to advocate on issues that are impactful for all of us. Mm -hmm. So I think we all have opportunities. So it's easy to get to, to feel overwhelmed at that, and that there isn't a place to make a difference. But right. I think an opportunity to make a difference. Agreed, agreed. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful show and discussion at probably our longest, an hour and 22 minutes, but I told you I wasn't letting anybody go home <laughs> unless they got the full well, impact of, of uh, Dr. Well, Hawkeye. Right. Well, and here here's the really good news. Most of our viewers watch this on YouTube. So, yeah. you know, you can go, go grab a cup of tea and come back and grab, yes. on, grab a cup of tea. And, yes, you know. yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much. And thank you to our viewers tonight. I know your your family's watching. I know our friends from Georgetown, they're watching. They're all chiming in in the comments. And, uh, you know, let's share this video. Share this video with, with people yes. you think need to hear the history of racism, how it's impacting black, Blacks in America, and what do we have to do to make an even playing field and justice and, and reform and, and just break down barriers that have been you know, in, in our system for too, way too long. Um, and healthcare is only one part of it, but we really appreciate your, um, your time um, and your, um, your experience, your knowledge, and um, just keep- Your journey. Keep, your journey. Yes, your journey and keep, keep fighting, you know, keep, keep fighting and being passionate in your lane. And, and hopefully you will um, encourage other people to do so in their lane. But uh, we thank you so very much for being on the show. Thank, thank you. Ladies. Thank you for this wonderful platform. It's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>